All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Zach Guten, who is literally just up the road in Los Angeles. And Zach is the president and founder of Think Alike Media. How are you doing, Zach? Hey, John. Thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to be on. Absolutely. Yeah. And and Zach and his company, Think Alike Media, they help uh, business to business um, clients with their cold all the way through to close uh, the whole process. And what I wanted to talk to Zach a little bit about today is one of their key, one of your key differentiators, you say, is the is at the, the, the front of the funnel, at the top of the funnel, with the hyper-personalization. So explain to me what hyper-personalization is and why is it important today and what difference does it make? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I like to think of us as sort of the antithesis to uh, businesses that look to do very broad outreach. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is looking for specific targets. Uh, so typically our, our clients might have uh, one or more uh segments that they want to pursue. And we want to be hyper-personalized both in terms of who we're targeting within those segments, uh, uh, as well as the messaging that we're sending to them. Because ultimately, those two things matching up is where we see the result. We're able to find the use cases for a specific type of user, present that to them. And depending on the use cases that our client's product uh, is able to offer, we're able to get that into different market segments and, and illustrate the value. Yeah, because I mean, a, a lot of companies kind of default into the into the more broad approach because they either don't have the the skill or the resources, or they don't feel like they have the time to really get down into into really you know uh, minute segmentation or personalization on the scale that you uh, the way that you do. So, what allows you to be able to do this in a way that maybe a lot of companies aren't? Well, I think, you know, we're, we, we really want to look at it from a messaging standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, if what we're saying is broad, it's probably not going to ring true for anybody. So it's almost a, a, an effort in futility at that point. If, if we're going to take an, an, an outreach effort, if we're going to try and bring a product into uh, a new market or try to uh, penetrate deeper into a market that it's already in, we really want to be able to establish why and what is the value that these buyers should be seeing. And so the more we know about those buyers, the more uh, hyper-personalized we are and, and, and we're able to accomplish that using tools like LinkedIn Sales Navigator and Crunchbase to really find the persona of the person that we're reaching out to and establish the use case for them. And then in the messaging itself, you know, one of the things I think that we do particularly well is we try to be very conversational. We want to really look for an opportunity to tell a story. And the people that we're reaching out to, rather than telling them what we do for them, we want to know about them and have a sense of the challenges they're facing so that we can say, here's what you're doing and here's how we think we could potentially work together. What we find is in those cases, when you find the people and you find the use cases, the reason that they're interested is because they have a challenge. And professionally, when people have a challenge that they're dealing with day to day, it's stressing them out. And if somebody's able to conduct a conversation with them about that, they're more than happy to get it off their chest and explain what the problem is. And in doing so, they're telling you why they need your product. Yeah, absolutely. And and let's be honest, I mean, today you have such, you know, there's all the technologies for filtering out of emails and block and all that. And putting the technology aside, right? I mean, human beings, we we've, we've have this now almost inbuilt ability to be able to glance at an email and almost categorize it immediately as oh, that's just a rote um, marketing email, or that's the, you know, that's another rote prospecting email. So to your point is like, we're pretty good at filtering that stuff out. So you have to take a different approach. You have to take a different approach. And I think, you know, to your point is, if you can stand out, because we're so good at just shuffling those things aside, when one comes across that does stand out, that strikes a nerve for you in some way, catches you right away, you tend to go, okay, I'm looking at that. Mm -hmm. Like, well, what is it about that? And, and you know, I think that's that's what we see time and again is, is people responding to that. And I love, of course, when, when prospects will say things on sales calls, uh, because we are part of the entire process. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, and it's a benefit to us to learn what happens downstream so that we can apply it uh, back in the messaging, but right. we love being on those calls and hearing someone say to a client, like, you know, I don't typically respond to cold emails, but Zach's message really got through. Ah, it's obviously a big win for me when that happens. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm absolutely. And to be honest, I mean, that's I'm like that. I mean, I receive tons and tons of emails, but if one hits me that either is intriguing 
and also is about something that impacts or affects me and that I care about, yeah, then then I'll react to it. But other than that, I probably won't. And I do. And to your point, I do tend to tell people, uh, oh, by the way, you know, your your email kind of intrigued me. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Because they, they, you know, in, in, in sales, as always, we all feel enough rejection. So it's, it's nice to know when you when you when it's worked. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell me a little bit about maybe a couple of examples? You don't have to name the companies, but just examples of initiatives you did with companies and what the results were, and maybe maybe even things that were surprising to the company uh, when you when you implemented your solution. Absolutely, you know my my favorite case study that I love to share is is uh, it's a company in in an industry that I knew absolutely nothing about when I started with them, and that's become more often the case now. But this was a little earlier in in the time uh, that since I started Think Alike, uh, and and I come from a, a background in media and entertainment technology, mm-hmm. just to set this up properly. And so um, I, for the when I I had helped a company to uh, grow to the point of an acquisition at about twenty four million dollars, and then at that point I started Think Alike, and so. Uh, at first, I still worked with primarily companies that were in technology and media and entertainment. And along came this company in shipping and logistics. And I could tell you absolutely nothing about what their product did at the time. Um, but uh, you know, ultimately, sound mechanics in, in driving sales uh, with some tutelage from their side in terms of conveying the right features. Um, we were able to sell into a lot of different targets. But my, my favorite example is into Pepsi. They're a product that is used uh, for major manufacturers to ship uh, track their shipments uh, into wholesale markets. And so obviously you can imagine Pepsi's shipping volume. And uh, sure. it's it's it, the, the license itself is worth uh, $480,000 a year. Um, you can imagine the scope of the, the volume um, that, that Pepsi does. And so for this particular product, um, it, it was a game changer. This was a company that was doing less than a million dollars in annual revenue. And all of a sudden this kind of changes the dynamic for what they're able to do. And, 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 and the, the services uh, and, and features they're able to provide because they had a road Map map of, of iterations they wanted to get to. It suddenly that expedited that process. Um, an, another uh, and a great a great part of that story too is just to point out is we had to we were targeting multiple people within Pepsi and right. uh, ultimately we were able to. Uh, we got responses from two different people. And and I think that's really important is in B2B, you really are building consensus. There's never going to be one person at a business. Businesses are set up for checks and balances. There shouldn't be one person just making a decision unless it's a very small company. You're targeting big companies. There's never going to be just one person to win over. You've got to win over two, a lot of times more than that people. And we take a, a staggered approach to reaching different people in an organization so that they're never receiving messages on the same day, but that ultimately we can start to bring those decision makers together. And that really happened with Pepsi was we had one division of the company supporting it, and then we got another one. And when we brought them together, the deal was done. Um, yeah. And, and just on just on that, uh, let me just uh, underline a couple of things you said there. I mean, particularly about in b2b sales generally like selling it you know that there's there's more than one decision maker but it's not there's not even just more than one decision maker there's often there's often more than one decision makers there's naysayers there's influencers there's a whole range of people um that's why in our crm we have a buying center or a political map where you can map all of these things out but i think that's a really critical thing for people to take away is that multiple outreach to do because because let's face it there's a lot of people fall into that traditional trap of like they latch on they get one person right one person responds to them and then they just glom onto them you know like a limpet under a ship and they just hang on to them for dear life and are almost afraid to spread out for fear of you know for fear of you know dissing the person who initially they had contact with that's exactly right. You don't you don't want to feel like you're going around that person. They might think, oh, I'm not moving fast enough for you. Like, mm-hmm. and 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 really that's where it's important to know, okay, you know, which parts of the company are you targeting? Because if if you're if you can illustrate, look, that that uh, in, in, in that particular use case, like there's a warehouse management user that needs that product. There's also an operations person that needs to understand that product. And to, those are two very different parts of a very large company there. And no one of those people ever felt like they were challenged. Now, if you had targeted the same similar person right within their ranks, that's gonna maybe rub them the wrong way. So you have to be very deliberate about who you're targeting. Yeah, no, and it's it's a really it's a really good point, and it's such a it's such a a, a great example as well 
um, of, of being able to work multiple people within an organization and and take a take a more strategic approach to it. And clearly, landing a, a logo like Pepsi has probably helped that uh, help your client inordinately with other prospects. Yeah, you know, they they had a, a great portfolio of, of of clients. And ultimately, that was the first real food and beverage example. So that laid the ground for a great outreach and additional case studies to other types of businesses like that. Uh, and, and, you know, that's that's an example of a very large deal. Um, and, and, and frankly, one of the largest in my career. But we've helped other businesses that are very small, too. I, I have a, a client based in Australia who is a meditation coach. And he is a one man band, a one man operation and uh, built an online uh, meditation course. And not only have we been able to do uh, media outreach to get him exposure, but we've been able to solidify uh, partnerships with uh, his med uh, meditation is used to help uh, people who are not, necess not necessarily alcoholics and need more clinical help, but really uh, have control, uh, perhaps have been drinking too much and have control of it still. And they'll use his meditation as a way to uh, uh, take more control of that. And, and um, we've been able to sell, license his courses into chains of, of rehabilitation clinics all throughout the United States. And mm. he's a one man operation. And these are deals that are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so, um, you know, it, 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 it really can be very different types of businesses uh, and, and accomplish some great results. Wow, his margins must be awesome. His margins are awesome. He's a very happy <laughs> client of ours. Uh, we we and and I'll be you know again I'll be very honest. Uh, when we got that first one, it was a real win. It was a, a surprise because we didn't realize that use case existed. We saw the opportunity for media outreach to see uh, really drive almost like consumer sales to him, sure. partnering him with affiliates and, and doing that sort of B two B expansion. Along the way, though, we, we, we found this use case where a clinic was willing to license it across multiple locations. Once we had that use case, we were able to turn and look for others. And lo and behold, we found another one. And that's the type of thing we're working on right now as we speak and pursuing even third and more. Yeah, I mean, that's a fascinating one there, because as you say, I mean, you started off with thinking that this was a, a B2C offering and, you know, which is fine, but it's obviously it's a longer road when you're selling like onesie twosies. Um, but the fact that you're able to um, migrate into into B two B, I mean that's such a that's such a fan that's such a fantastic story. And and what was it what was it that prompted you to to try the B two B route? How did that come about? Sure. So um, you know my my background again um, is media and entertainment technology. Mm -hmm. For a long time, I was with a company called Final Draft, and and Final Draft is a leading software uh, in the film and television business. It's used to right. uh, format and write screenplays. So most mm -hmm. most TV shows or films that you watch, the scripts for those are written using a software called Final Draft. And I was director of studio relations there for many years, and then became vice president of sales and, and led the company to an acquisition. And one of the ways that we expanded our revenue, um, Final Draft is. Is, uh, in, in a sense, it's almost like uh, sneakers because although we are selling B2B, uh, our, our studio users there, our high profile filmmakers are the Michael Jordans. And ultimately then we're selling a lot of consumer product because our Michael Jordan is using our product and, right. and all the Michael Jordans are using that product. Um, but that B2B market, the, that was, was something that really uh, hadn't been uh, pursued hard enough, especially when it came to international sales. And so what we found was we were really savvy in B2C email marketing. We knew how to convert our B2C users, and we knew there was a lot of, a lot of meat left on the bone in terms of B2B. And so we started adopting the email campaign theology into B2B, which was, let's be very conversational. Let's be short and sweet. Let's find ways to get people interested without trying to give them all the information at once where it becomes overwhelming. Um, and we and the goal was, because we were a small team here in LA, was to be able to use B2B to target internationally, to be able to open up chains of, of business uh, with uh, international targets while we were sleeping. So these email campaigns were going out in Pacific Coast here. We were, we were in the middle of the night. And the next morning, we'd come in and we'd have 
have new replies and we'd be able to uh, engage people and when necessary, schedule a demo with them at some off hour to get it done. Uh, but ultimately it opened up this huge additional channel of international business and really uh, helped lead Final Draft in their sales growth, um, which when I started my company was, was part of the reason that I wanted to, to, to focus on B2B email. Yeah, and and I guess uh, one of the interesting things just uh, coming out of that as well is the fact that, you know, especially because of the pandemic, et cetera, you know, a lot of people's businesses obviously have been impacted negatively. Um, that here's a great example of maybe being able to branch out into an adjacent market, right? So when you're going moving from B2C into B2B, maybe, um, maybe you adapt your product or service a little bit for it. But it just shows you that there there are maybe more opportunities for your product or service than you actually think. Absolutely. I, 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 there's a couple of things to say here. One is the, in doing the segmentation and the personalization that we're doing, obviously this is a sales and marketing effort first and foremost, but there is a component of market research that takes place. You're able to identify within that personalization, within that segmentation, where's the traction coming from? And mm -hmm. sometimes you'll be surprised. And some of our clients come to us knowing like, hey, we've got low hanging fruit. We've done well in this one industry, but we've noticed lately this other industry is taking an interest in our product. We want to see what more is there. And so we can start to go, okay, great. Let's spend a couple of weeks targeting where you know you should be able to close deals. And then let's go to this more experimental route and let's see what's there. And if we're finding after a month or two that there is a there there, let's keep pursuing that. Let's maybe emphasize that because you've already got this other market. So there's a market research component that plays out. Um, and in terms of, 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 of pivoting, and, and especially within the pandemic, uh, two case studies, I'll try to be quick. One is a, a company that has suffered and one that has done well. One is a, a company that uh, was specifically in the, in the live event space. It was uh, cameras, um, camera equipment that creates 360 degree or 180 degree photos. You'll see them at big convention trade show booths. You can imagine what happened to their business, just a grinding mm. halt. And what we did there was we took, a, a, we decided to take that head on. We took the approach of let's do outreach to people uh, in the event space who are also suffering. And let's say to them, look, we realize our industry is in a freeze right now. While we have this opportunity where we're both kind of at a stalemate, maybe now is a chance for us to talk to one another. We can commiserate together. We can get to know each other in a way we wouldn't normally have time for. The humanity of it drove so much response that we opened up all these relationships that immediately we couldn't take advantage of, but that client did pivot their product. They started creating, they, they white labeled an online photo booth service so that they could start to sell this for virtual events. Now, this all started at the start of the pandemic and then months later, we had all started to adapt and virtual events were happening. And those same event planners, those same relationships bared fruit and they were able to sell into those. Now, pivot on, on the positive side, a client of mine has a software that's used in market research, video-based market research. Their competitor, their main competitor to any large company that would use their product is focus groups. Companies were more comfortable in traditional focus groups. Mm -hmm. Well, when the pandemic hit, our competitors became our clients. We turned to focus groups and we said, look, you can't do this anymore. You can't have 10 people sitting around a table for two hours. Here's our product that allows you to do it virtually in a way that is secure and allows you to uh, analyze what's coming through. And that was very effective. So pivots are important. Yeah, and and I think the, the interesting thing as well is uh, with people who've had traditional types of customers is that, yeah, um, as in the example that you raised there, you know, the, the company that does the online or the virtual focus groups, that's not going to go away. Even when the pandemic's over or whatever, you're still, there's still going to be people who say, yes, it's more cost effective or more convenient or for whatever reason, or maybe it's just more effective for some people to continue to do it virtual. So this is the nice thing is that it's not just, it's not a, that there are people just doing these things temporarily, is that some of these are going to endure. Absolutely. And, and that is the case there. You know, we were trying to prove a sort of foresight of here's, you know, there's no need to be, because when you do focus groups for business, they need to go to different parts of the country in order to build an accurate representation yeah. of, of, of feedback. And so, well, now you're taking some high priced executive out of the office for a week, you're flying them around, you're putting them up in hotels, you're paying them a stipend, and you're, you're taking hours and hours out of their time to go conduct those focus groups. There are other alternatives. This sort of forced the hand to make other mm -hmm. businesses see that and try yeah. it. And you don't even know how effective that person's going to be until they're in the focus group, do they? After you've invested Absolutely. all that money in them. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, listen, Zach, this has been fantastic. I mean, very interesting. All of Zach's information is going to be below this video um, and all the links to find out more about Think Alike Media. Um, but before we go, Zach, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Well, thanks so much, John. Um, you know, uh, you know, like I said, I, I come from a, a background in media and entertainment technology. I was with Final Draft for over 10 years and had an amazing experience working with very high profile filmmakers, with television studios uh, and, and, and uh, film studios. Um, over the last five years, five plus years now, Think Alike Media has worked with hundreds of clients, uh, primarily small businesses. Most of our clients are three or less people. We've also worked with bigger businesses as well. But ultimately what we do is, is we help companies to uh, in their B2B outreach, whether that's direct sales, building affiliate networks or media outreach. Um, and we have a sort of uh, predefined uh, package that we offer to clients. It's a retainer based model. And, um, you know, we, we really love working with a diverse set of clients. And so we have all kinds of fun case studies. So anyone out there who is interested in, in learning more or wanting to connect, I'm, I'm sure we have interesting case studies we could share with them. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, uh, thanks again, Zach. And thank you all for watching and listening. And I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you, John.